My name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an extension economist, economist with NDSU Extension and the usual moderator of our monthly egg market situation outlook webinar that we're holding today. Um, it, following the usual format, uh, we'll have a series of presentations with questions at the end. Uh, one exception today is that Frayne does have to leave early due to another commitment, and so he'll take his questions immediately after his remarks. I uh, ask that you use the chat or the Q&A tool to ask questions, and we'll get to those at the end with the exception of Frayne. But with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. All right, so uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, the November edition, I'm going to quickly plug and talk about some of the highlights from the my my section of our backgrounding webinars that NDSU Extension is putting out uh, this that is put out in the last couple of weeks. So the one, a couple I really want to in the beginning cover a couple of concepts um, just in case those who are unfamiliar or need a quick refresher who are on this uh, webinar right now. And this is from 2018, but what it what this illustrates this this uh, line chart here is the price slide or the price per hundred weight difference for different weight cattle or calves. So if you look, for instance, if you had 500 to 550 weight calves on this chart, they're worth $180 per hundred weight, okay? Or $1.80, uh, uh, yeah, $180 per hundred weight or, or $1.80 a pound. And then you come down here to the size of calves that we would typically call backgrounded or you know ready to go to the lots, 800 to 850 weight, uh, just under a dollar fifty per hundred, or uh, yeah, a dollar fifty a pound, or one hundred and fifty per hundred weight, down to almost nine weights, which are closer to one hundred and forty dollars per hundred weight, or or a dollar forty a pound. So as the animals get heavier, okay, the price per hundred weight or the price per pound goes down. So overall, the animal's worth more because it weighs a lot more, but the price per pound goes down. Now, why does that typically happen? Well, because as the price goes up, there's less weight to be put on before they're finished. Okay, so if you're thinking of it from the perspective of a feedlot or a finisher, uh, the less weight there is to be put on, if you make your money by putting on weight, okay, then, there, then there's less money to be made. So they, they wind up paying less per pound. All right, so a couple of concepts, again, that I, I wanted to cover in. I know this is a little bit dated. This research was from 2000, and so the corn prices were very different uh, when this happened versus today. So if it makes you feel better, we could put low-priced corn at $3.40 and high-priced corn right here at, let's call it $7 and then something in the middle. But what this graph illustrates is that when, when corn prices or feed prices in general are very low, the price difference between eight weight and say 550 weight or 850 and 550 weight calves, the price difference is the greatest. I mean, it's the highest. Why? Because when feed is cheap, you can make a lot more money if you're a feeder putting on weight. So they're willing to pay more for weaned calves because they want to, cattle feeders and finishers want to put the weight on themselves because feed is cheap. When feed is expensive, this line is flatter. That means that the price difference between 550 weight and 850 weight cattle is much narrower, much closer together per pound or per hundred weight. Why? Because feed is more expensive. It's harder to make money putting on weight. And therefore, the price difference between weaned calves and these 800 to 850 weights is much closer together. In other words, you can't afford to pay as much for weaned calves when feed prices are high. Pretty straightforward. Then on the other side or the other end of the spectrum is finished cattle prices, okay? So finished cattle prices, when finished cattle prices are high, they're actually much higher than this right now. Again, this was from 2000, but you might consider a high price, $180 per hundred weight or $200 per hundred weight being a high price and then everything down from that. But when prices are high, there again, that price gap between weaned calves and uh you know, backgrounded or 850 weight calves is the is the greatest. Why? Because finished cattle prices are high. You make a lot of money um, when, when you sell in the end. Therefore, you can afford to pay more for the weaned calf. When finished cattle prices are low or fed cattle prices are low relative to all other prices, well, now I can't afford to pay as much money per weaned calf. And therefore, the price difference between 550 weights and 850 weights is much narrower, hence a flatter line like right here. All right, so we did the scenarios for uh, our six typical scenarios that we often do for backgrounded calves, uh, backgrounding and finishing. And this year, uh, it is really tough to make money on steers, mainly because 
not because prices are poor, it's quite the opposite. Prices of uh, weaned steers are so strong that uh, it's, it's hard to actually make, make money putting on the weight. What this is telling you is that cattle feeders and finishers, uh, they really want your weaned steers and they're willing to pay a lot for them. And they don't want you to put the weight on. They themselves want to go ahead and do it because of the lower feed cost. They're willing to pay for the weans, a lot for wean steers. And it's just hard to turn a profit in that situation. The third steer scenario is all the way to finish, 575 to 1400 In this case, you, you kind of put on, you make about 69 cents per day for a profit loss per head total of 151 bucks. And mainly... The reason that there's a profit at all is because there's actually a strong price in the end for, for fed cattle. On the other hand, you have the heifer scenarios. Now, why are the heifer scenarios so much bigger and so much more profit to be gained by backgrounding uh, heifers? Whether you put on a slower ration and, and a lower uh, a lower nutrient intense ration gaining about a 1.8 to 2 pounds a day versus 3 pounds a day 3 pounds a day is often always typically the hotter the ration or the higher the ration the 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 more profitable it is because the yardage doesn't eat you up so that's $250 per head or $2.50 per day cuz they're only on feed for 100 days so why are heifers so much more profitable this year than steers well let's this is from uh a couple of weeks ago uh, these are averages across North Dakota, and Tim will talk way more about markets. I just want to show, illustrate why these differences happen. If you look at 500 to 550 weight steers, okay, so let's, on average, 520, 528 weights, $321 per hundred weight, okay? Or 575 weights, $300 almost, just 301 per hundred weight for steers in that class. But you, then you come down here to say 850 weights, uh, 860 weights, you get 250 dollars per hundred weight. So 50, 60, 70 dollars difference uh, between wean steer prices per hundred weight and uh, backgrounded. Then if you look at heifer prices, okay, you come up here to the five, 550, 542 weights, 272 dollars or so, 273 dollars per hundred weight. Come down here to the 8, 15, 850 weights, 200 and let's call it $240 per hundred weight. So the difference between weaned heifers of the same weight as steers and then fit, uh, backgrounded heifers uh, is a lot closer. It's much closer together. And so basically what you're doing is you're closing that price slide gap from heifers to steers, which always exists. Heifers are typically anywhere from $30, $40 per hundred weight on weaned calves. And then that price slide gap closes to... 10 12 15 dollars per hundred weight and by closing that gap you you can make a profit there plus the fact that there's cheap feed and tim's talked about this many times this concept that backgrounding heifers is often a profitable scenario or a profitable uh, endeavor and backgrounding steers is just is is a little bit is a little bit tougher to actually make money doing it i mean you really got to get your feed cost low and then the other thing is if you want to learn more about it, I encourage you uh, in looking at these scenarios, I encourage you to go to uh, our website here where I go much more in depth into the scenarios that I'm showing here and discussing what's going on, how we're, what we're charging for feed, what we're charging for vet meds, what we're charging for everything else. And the other thing to think about, and I've been harping on this when, whenever I'm talking about it, when, when weaned calf prices are this strong, if you are going to background, you almost it's it's really tough if you don't buy some sort of risk protection mechanism. And I know Tim is going to talk about those. But if the price moves against you and you're backgrounding and you don't buy a risk protection product, if I take 20, 10, 20, 30 dollars per hundred weight off of that backgrounded calf price, or if it moves against you in that direction, those numbers get really red really fast and they get really big and really red really fast. So in a year when your weaned calves are worth that much money, if you're going to hold on to them, you, you, you got to protect yourself with those livestock risk protection mechanisms. So that's really all I had in today's uh, uh, webinar was just discussing um, our backgrounding uh, scenarios and, and uh, the, the program that we put on that you can reach online, uh, their YouTube videos. Um, you can feel free to contact me or anyone else that, that put these uh, webinars together uh, with any questions you, that you might have. But again, uh, there, there's generally money to be made backgrounding. 
uh, calves. You just got to uh, know how to do it. And then the last thing I'll say, because one of the questions I got was, well, what if I want to keep the lot full? What if I've got overhead to spread out? This might be a year where you're selling your wean steers and then going to the auctions if you got extra capacity and buying heifers at auction and then going ahead and backgrounding them out and you wind up with a with a lot mostly filled with heifers. All right, so with that, I am going to stop sharing and turn this over to Dr. Frayne Olson. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to be here actually in person now for a while. Uh, I'm going to try and provide an update on what's happening in the in the markets in general, but with a specific emphasis on the most US, most recent USDA information. Um, again, here's my contact information if you do want to get a hold of me. Uh, I guess the most reliable would be my cell phone and or my email. Uh, again, my travel schedule is starting to pick up pretty extensively now as we get close to the holidays. Um, and it's in, I'm going to be traveling a lot between, in particular, Thanksgiving and, and, and Christmas. So please bear with me a little bit. If I don't get back to you right away, please have a little bit of grace and patience. And I'll, I, will, I will respond as soon as I can. So let's dive right in. A couple things, key market issues. These are some of the things that I've been watching, some of the things that the, the, the markets have been talking about. At the very end, I'm going to, be, I guess, provide some commentary on on kind of trade and some of the trade issues. Uh, I know that's becoming a really, really uh, hot topic right now. And I will, I will make some comments on that and try and answer questions if there are any. So first, let's, let's again go back to the USDA WASDE, the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates, as well as the production reports. So again, once a month, USDA updates these forecasts or projections. The reason I spend so much time on this, the reason that a lot of market analysts and traders talk about these numbers is because that becomes that, that reference point, that kind of stake in the ground that we use to say, well, this is where, where USDA says we're at. This is the, most, the best information we have, given what, what we have out there. Um, so let's adjust those expectations based off of new information. And every month, of course, what's happening is USDA keeps adjusting and tweaking and modifying our stake in the ground a little bit to, to compensate for and adjust. Okay, so if we don't understand what's going on in the WASDE, it's pretty hard to understand what some of the other private analysts and, and forecasters and things are talking about because we typically use the USDA numbers as that common starting point. Okay, so I'm going to go through those, those numbers in just a moment. Just a really high level uh, snapshot. The WASDE numbers, the USDA numbers reports, and I just want to remind everybody, you know, they remember when the WASDE report or numbers come out and prices go down. They don't remember when prices go up. And so I just want to point out that we had at this report some positive news that came out for both corn and soybeans. I guess I think myself as well as others would consider the, the, the reports neutral for wheat and wheat prices. So quick update on what's happening in South America because that is going to be a continuing topic throughout the rest of the winter. Brazil is about two-thirds complete with their, their planting progress. So when you look at all of the, 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 the soybeans planted in Brazil, they're about two-thirds complete. They've been making really good progress. Um, now, Argentina is, is, is a little further behind. Of course, they're further south, which really means that they're a little bit colder. Uh, they're closer to the Antarctic. It'd be more similar to North Dakota versus, let's say, Texas. All right? Um, so... The Argentine soybean planting is at about 8% complete. Um, they have been getting some rain showers coming through. And so that's, that's actually been helpful because there have been some areas in particular in the core soybean and, and corn growing regions that have been relatively dry. So the other thing as an update from our, some of our last discussions in both Brazil and Argentina, the weather conditions have actually been very favorable. Um, you know, daytime temperatures have been a bit warm, especially in Brazil in that Mato Grosso region, which is in the north, but we, they've been getting rain showers. And so the soil moisture conditions are starting to improve. Planting progress has been making rapid advancements. Um, right now, there really is no emerging threats, at least not significant threats, uh, coming out of South America and South American weather. All right, so let's do a real quick uh, recap and update on what the, what the production numbers were first. Um, so as at just following history, um, what I try and do is compare what is the USDA numbers, um, what, what was released versus what does the trade expect to see. So the blue line on top, the blue row on top is the average trade estimate. 
Um, so again, the survey is conducted of, of major traders and analysts and say, what do you expect the USDA number to be? Um, the black line, the highlighted black line towards the bottom is last month's information. And then of course, the red line on the very bottom is the numbers that we actually received. And what I try and remind everybody, I know you're going to get tired of me saying this, but what we really want to do is compare the blue line on top with the red line on bottom. You know, the last, last month's information is important, but what was the trade expecting to see versus what did we actually receive? So let's talk a little bit about corn yield numbers first. So the trade was expecting basically the same numbers. They really weren't expecting much adjustment in the, in the corn yields. And what surprised people a bit was that actually USDA took that number down a bit. Um, there were some analysts before the, uh, the announcement or before the report came out, looking back historically said, well, big crops get bigger. And I, and I saw a lot of kind of that was the expectation, even though the average is basically a push from, from the October numbers. I think there was a, a significant number of traders that were expecting a larger yield. Um, and in reality, they took the yield down, which again caused this, this, this minor rally or this pop in the corn price. So if you take the higher, the lower yield, times uh, the harvested acreage, you come up with about a 15.1 billion bushel crop, which is still significant. I mean, that's still a really, really big number. It's just we're taking the top end off of it. On the soybean side, a very similar adjustment. Um, the, the trade was expecting a slight reduction. Uh, in, in particular, I think because of the Western Corn Belt, some of the yield reports coming out of, of the Western Corn Belt was not quite as as good and aggressive as it was, let's say, in the, in the I states. Um, but we got a number much lower than what they had expected. So again, the trade was expecting a 52.8. We actually got 51.7, which is in the soybean world, a pretty significant reduction. And so again, that put a, a lift into the soybean market, put more of an updraft. We don't quite have as many bushels that we need to try and find a home for. Uh, it's not that we have to start rationing consumption very hard. Uh, but we do have to at least be recognizing that there was a there's smaller production than what we first anticipated. Moving on to ending stocks. So ending stocks, it's not just the supply side, but it's also the demand side. So if you take total supply minus total demand, how much do we expect to have left over in the grain bin? I.e., another way of thinking about it is what's our margin for error in case there's a problem? If we have a shock or a surprise and we have to make, make some adjustments, how much flex or how much uh, um, extra room do we have within, within our storage and our, our merchandising system to be able to absorb those, those different shocks. Starting with the wheat, the blue line on top again is the number that, we ex that, was, the, that was expected, that's the average trade guess. The number on the very bottom in red was the number that we actually got. So for wheat, there really wasn't much change. There wasn't any adjustments um, in the the production numbers, there was a small little tweaks in the consumption numbers. I would consider that basically a push. Thus, the reason that the wheat market really didn't get caught up in some of the updraft that the corn and soybeans had. When we look at the corn numbers, uh, that drop in ending stocks, the reduction in ending stocks is almost exclusively from, almost 100% from this reduction in production. There were very, very small minor changes just little tweaks here and there in the corn consumption numbers. So most of that reduction, the reduction we had in the supply side, dropped all the way down to our bottom line. For soybeans, again, we had the reduction in supply, but USDA also made some adjustments in the consumption. So they also actually reduced some of the consumption numbers because of these, these larger, uh, the, the smaller supply side, the, the, the lower yields, um, the expectation was prices will rise. The whole idea behind rising prices is to start rationing consumption a little bit. So for both domestic crush as well as exports, they, they adjusted their production, their forecasts, their estimates for both crush and exports down just a little bit, which then it did tighten up our bottom line, right? There's not as many, we don't expect to have as many beans in the pipeline as what we did before, but it, it could have been much smaller if they wouldn't have made those adjustments. Okay, so there is some compensation that goes on. We definitely tightened up some of the supply uh, conditions on soybeans, but again, this is the, the 4 point, uh, 470 million bushels is still a very large number. Nobody's really worried about running out of soybeans. Okay, let me shift now into some more things that are going on, um, in, in, in particular, watching exports and export sales. So this is the, the tables that I've updated as of this morning. 
Um, let me just explain this table. I've done this before, but I do want to explain it for anybody that's new on the call. So the, the, the columns, these four columns on the left-hand side are our annual or total export sales for the marketing year. So 2021 versus 2023-24. So this is the last four years of total full data that we have for our export sales. So those are actual numbers. Okay, and what I, a lot of times we just look at the total numbers, this is bottom line, but I wanna look a little bit deeper and say, well, which countries are buying our crops? So it's not just about what are the total volume sales, but who's buying it and have they changed their buying habits? Okay, now on the two columns on the far right-hand side, those are year-to-date totals. So the far right-hand side here, this 2425, that's our export commitments. So those are contracts that have been made and signed for the sale of grain to be delivered sometime in the future. Okay, so this is, we're accumulating all of the sale that's been, all of the sales under contract, even though some of that may or may not have been delivered, okay? So that's from September 1 through, in this case, the end of October. So notice the date up here. This information was released this morning. There's always about a, a one week lag in the data. Okay, now this is the same, this column right next to it is the same time period last year. So notice 2324, that's the 12 month total. This 2324 column is year to date. So we can compare how are our sales this time this year versus the same time period last year. So just a couple comments, a couple observations. If we look at the top uh, uh, destinations for U.S. corn, notice again, Mexico historically has been our number one customer, except for this 2021 time period in which China was our number one customer. And the reason that China was number one in that year was that was the tail end of that phase one trade agreement. Remember, we had the trade war. And then there was a phase one agreement where China promised to buy more U.S. agricultural products, which they did, but they didn't live up to the commitments in the, in, the, in the phase one agreement. So they did purchase more, but not as much as what they said they were going to purchase. Now, since then, obviously, Chinese purchases of U.S. corn have dropped off dramatically. Uh, the Mexican sales actually from last year, because they had a drought in, in, their, in their core corn growing regions, um, ended up buying more U.S. corn. Uh, Japan historically has been a very good customer. Last year, Colombia came on as a pretty good customer. And then we have a whole bunch of others below that. This ROW is rest of the world. So it's all of the countries on the list that have bought corn from us that are not included in this top category. So how are we doing so far this year? Well, Mexico is ahead of last year's pace, which is very good. That's been, we've had some very good export sales into Mexico, in particular for corn. Japan is also coming back and buying some more U.S. corn. Part of that is because we are seeing lower prices. Again, as lower prices, they tend to buy more. This is the price relationships we're looking at for supply and demand. And then Colombia. Again, Colombia has come in and, and at, so far this year has bought more corn than they have this time last year. But I want to drop down to this ROW, or rest of the world. Notice last year we had a, about 4 million metric ton of other sales. So far we've got 10 million metric ton of other sales. So yes, we're picking up some additional sales from our core customers, but there's a lot of new people or people that have kind of nibbled on the edges and not bought much corn from the United States that are now coming back because we do have the lower prices. So, so far our export sales for corn are actually in a very good shape. Um, you know, we've had a drop off in, in export sales the last couple of years, but it looks like we're going to see a rebound this year, which again is supportive for corn prices. And again, we have lots of corn to be able to sell. Now I'm going to shift to soybeans. And, and when I'm done with the soybean discussion, I'm going to comment a little bit on some things that is developing now as we move forward in time. And, and in particular, looking at some trade and possible trade issues. For soybeans, same layout. We got four, four columns on the left are the, are the 12 month totals. Uh, we have year to date totals for comparison. Not a big shock or surprise to anybody. China is our number one customer. Um, they were off significantly last year in their purchases of US soy, primarily because Brazil had a very, very large crop. In fact, they had two years of, of near record production in a row. So they have very adequate supplies. Yes, the Chinese are buying US, U.S. soybeans today, but it's at about the same pace as what we saw last year. Okay, now, 
Obviously, the political environment with the presidential election has, have, has changed the dynamic. There's a lot of people asking questions about potential uh, round two of the trade war with China. What are the implications for all of that? And to be very blunt, it's far too early to tell. You know, I think everybody you listen to and everybody that has, has some commentary on it has slightly different view and visions. And to be very blunt, we're not really sure what the Trump administration is, is planning, what kind of tariff uh, amounts will be on what products. And more importantly, then, are there going to be some retaliatory tariffs put on by the Chinese onto U.S. products? We just don't know. It's too early. However, there has been some change of habits, been some change in buying habits that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Okay, just on another, uh, just to, to finish this discussion out, Mexico is our second largest buyer. And again, Mexico is, you know, I'd say distant number two. I get that. I understand that. But Mexico is still a major consumer of, of U.S. soy. Okay, then we drop down to Indonesia and to Japan. So that's kind of the top four. Uh, we do send some soy into uh, Europe, and we have to be watching that as we move forward in time. There's some potential political things going on in Europe that might give us some advantages over the South American soybeans. But again, it's a little bit too early to tell. When we look at today, the ex exports, uh, this is again sales now, not necessarily deliveries, but sales. Um, the Chinese are pretty much right on pace where they were this time last year. Mexico is a little bit behind. Um, I think some of that is because they've been so aggressive in buying some U.S. corn. When you look at Indonesia, Japan, a lot of the other countries, very, very similar. I do want to again drop down to this ROW, rest of the world. So notice that there's a lot of other countries that are not listed on this that have increased their purchases of U.S. soy. Again, that's a good thing. We're help, that this helps diversify our supply chains, diversify our customer base. So that is a positive signal. It's just that these are smaller sales and don't always uh, get picked up in the, in the ag news. So if we look at total export sales or commitments now, this is commitments, so far this year versus this time last year, we are ahead of last year's pace. Again, which is, which is good. That is consistent with what USDA has been forecasting. So this is my last slide, and I do want to focus on this for just a minute and then make a few additional comments, and then I'll hand things over to Tim Petrie. So what this shows is, the, again, these export commitments, the, the contracts for, for, that have been sold and signed. We've sold the grain. It just had, may or may not have been delivered by week. So the, each of these different colors represent a different year. Um, the red line is where we are to this time this year. And again, I updated it for, for the information released this morning. The green line is last year's numbers. And we have kind of have this historical uh, um, weekly uh, commitments numbers from uh, going back to about 2000, uh, uh, 2020. Okay, so that's the goal line. My moral is, yes, we've, we've been talking about this for a long time. We have this seasonal pattern of when we sell our soybeans. Again, the sales can be slightly different from deliveries, but at least we've been having some good sales pace. In fact, we're a little bit ahead of last year's numbers, which is what the, what the previous table showed us. The big question we have is twofold. Uh, number one, are we going to get additional sales as we move forward in time? And more importantly now, what is the delivery period? So here's the takeaway. This is the big thing I want you to remember from today's these, uh, seminar, is that there have been several reports over the last couple of weeks that yes, the Chinese are buying U.S. soybeans. They've been buying a little more aggressively than people had expected, but they're buying for delivery before or sometime within January. If, you, if, the, if the seller cannot guarantee delivery in the month of January, they don't want, us, don't want the sale. So if the delivery is af into February, March, or April, we're not making any sales into, into China. And the primary reason, at least the theory behind that is, the concern is, well, if it's delivered in February, there may be import tariffs or, or uh, some kind of tariff system that the Chinese have put on U.S. soy. And so if you're a company in China operating and buying U.S. soybeans, they're just not willing to take the risk of buying U.S. soybeans, delivering in, let's say, a February or March timeframe, 
because they're concerned that their government is going to put these import tariffs on U.S. soybeans, and suddenly the cost of their procurement and the cost of their soybeans went up significantly. So I have not ha heard that happening with corn, uh, but it has happened for soybeans and specifically for China. Now, some of our other customers, like a, a Mexico or like a Japan or a Philippines or a Taiwan, we have not been hearing those kind of stories out of those export sales. One of the things I also want to at least raise a little bit of a warning flag, a yellow flag here, is that there, there's also potentially some trade issues that might develop with, with Mexico. And because there's been discussions from the Trump administration about trying to renegotiate or reopen the USMCA, that US-Canada-Mexico agreement, the old NAFTA, and try and re renegotiate some of those terms. So, and, and obviously the, the, the border tensions between the United States and Mexico have been, been there and, and ongoing for a while. So far, those political tensions have not spilled over into agricultural trade or agricultural products. But again, we're looking at a new administration and we just don't know how that plays out. So with that, I'm going to, that's my last slide. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, I will try and take any quick questions if there are some. Uh, but I do have a commitment that I need to get to here shortly. So are there any questions before I have to drop off the the call? Hopefully that made sense to everybody. Uh, you guys know how to get a hold of me. Oh, looks like there is one in the Q&A here. Let me see if I can answer that question. Um, is there a data we can look forward to for the red flag? Um, so... Uh, yes. <laughs> um, over the, I would say for the next couple of weeks, I do expect the Chinese uh, purchases to kind of stay on pace. I think the real question will be what is going to be our additional sales, these additional commitments? Are we going to start to see more commitments from China as we get into, let's say, a November, early December? Because if they buy it, in, in December and expect delivery in January. It can be done, but that's a pretty tight timeline for international deliveries. So what I'm gonna be looking for as the red flag is what happens to our sales for both soybeans, but also corn to China specifically over the next, let's say two to three weeks. If that continues to stay relatively strong, I think there's, there's opportunities to be able to continue to make some sales. What I'm suspecting is some of those sales or those new announcements are going to start to drop off and we're going to start, stop hearing about these export sales into the Chinese market. So I'm, I'm watching those weekly export numbers as well as um, any kind of uh, daily numbers or, or daily announcements. If it's a large sale, the sale has to be announced within 24 hours. And so I am, I'm watching that very closely. So if you're listening to the radio or you're listening to, to the news, uh, that would be something that I would use as as a kind of as a quick reference point. Good question. Thank you. All right, I'm going to hand things over to Tim. I have to get going. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. We're just going to take a quick uh, update on the calf market and and uh, and how that's doing. And so you've seen this slide just about every time I talk. And are aware again that we've been going up cyclically and are at uh, cyclically record high prices. Uh, but we always do come off the summer pr uh, prices that I talked about last time. And uh, last time when I talked to you, we were about the same in price as we were last year for good reasons that I talked about. And that is because fed cattle were the same. Uh, beef production that I talked about last time is the same this year as it was last year because of heavyweights of cattle. But interestingly enough on calves, we have uh, seen a counter seasonal move upward usually at this since I last talked to you in October and then into November is a, a tough time to sell ca calves there are a lot of them coming to market these balling calves and so on and they usually go down until uh, right at the end of the year when they get sparked with uh, corn belt cattle buyers and then they tend to be weaned and, and so on but this year we've seen uh, an increase in the last month which is positive for those selling calves. 
And the main reason why that his uh, calf prices went up, well, first of all, we are short. We have fewer calves than last year. We're a short supply of calves. And uh, actually in uh, North Dakota, our calf run has been later than normal because the weather has been conducive to leaving cattle out on crop aftermath and so on. Not so, however, down in Oklahoma and in the Southern Plains because there were very, very dry down there. And, uh, and uh, so they had a little bit earlier movement on calves. So kind of on a U.S. basis, I, can't, I guess it kind of levels out, but we, you know, our calf run started uh, lower here. Now, when we talk about wheat grazing, and I'm going to show you a chart in a minute, sometimes we do get a spark in the market if the wheat grazing is really, really good. I was waiting for Frayne to talk about whether he was going to talk about wheat or anything. But anyway, it has been very, very dry down in Oklahoma, and there's no wheat grazing. I just talked to my counterpart down there yesterday, both in Oklahoma and Texas, but they have gotten a lot of rain, but we didn't get a spark from that. But what really has sparked the calf market is, is first of all, the lower supplies, but it's that the Corn Belt buyers are have came into the market earlier than normal, because the harvest went along really well, like it did in North Dakota. So they're ahead of schedule. And when corn prices are low, those uh, Western Corn Belt feedlots that sometimes feed the slaughter weight, they sometimes background, they uh, decide to put their corn through cattle instead of selling. When corn is seven bucks, you know, they're small enough, they can leave their lot open. So they just uh, aren't really interested in calves. However, when corn is low, like it is now, and they got a lot of it, just like Frayne said, then they're interested in in uh, in backgrounding or maybe feeding to slaughter wheat because there is, uh, is a little money in that. And so that's what uh, has helped to spark the market here. And uh, then uh, also, I'll show you in a minute that it, it uh, uh, did rain last week and uh, in Oklahoma a lot. Uh, average across the state was five inches, but you know some places the least got two inches up to eight inches or so. But the uh, wheat planting was behind schedule down there. They were planting into dust, but it didn't come up. And as of Monday of this week, only 79% of the wheat was planted compared to usually 90 to 95. So they are planting. But uh, talking to my counterparts down there, the, the wheat, even though it rained down there, is not really going to be ready for a month. And since it's so dry down there, they probably will tend to put uh, cows on that rather than calves. So we're getting the spark from the Corn Belt cattle buyers. So, uh, you know, up on top then is just the drought uh, monitor information from USDA that says how much of the winter wheat is in drought. And you see back on October 29th, 62% of the winter wheat was in drought. And uh, again, there wasn't any grazing available. When you go to today's drought monitor on the left-hand side, only we're now down to 43%. So we've seen quite a drop of the winter wheat in area in drought. It's just that it all isn't planted yet. And that, that that is planted isn't up yet. And so, uh, you know, uh, that that uh, is not going to be too much of help. But psychologically, it rained down there. And that makes the buyers happier. And so uh, certainly not a negative. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll even a little help in the market from that. So go below then. You see, here's the uh, corn for grain uh, harvested in Iowa, the red line is this year compared to the five-year average in green in 2023. Last year, we're way ahead of schedule. The Corn Belt buyers got their corn harvested earlier. Corn is cheap, and it's cheap at ethanol plants. And so they're in uh, helping to spark the, 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 the calf market is one of the big reasons and the lower supply. Now we go to the heavier weight yearlings. And uh, again, we see, you know, we've been cyclically going up uh, record high throughout most of the year, again, down to about the same a month ago. And uh, we did have a little bit of spark there, but we've been going, unlike calves that have been going up, uh, these heavier weight yearling prices have been going down and which is a seasonal thing, but it, there are very good reasons for that. And, that, and I'll get to that in a minute. Basically, it's that uh, fed cattle prices struggled the last week or so, or Q2 
came down a little bit from their highs and and the futures were are, are uh, fed cattle are struggling a little bit and then like frain said corn uh sparked here the last couple of weeks after uh the week or so and and so we'll see that on a i think i brought that chart we'll see that in, in a minute as well so calf prices are going up and and are well supported and are strong and you know uh these heavyweight yearlings are are supported at above last year's prices the other thing that i'll just mention there is those gold squares are the futures market the the red square at the end is the November feeder cattle that actually close a week early uh, this year. They close next Thursday because of the Thanksgiving holiday. They always close on a Thursday. But you see our cash market there is uh, has been above the futures. And that's been a, a normal thing. We've had a strong positive basis all year. Uh, uh, this last week, we averaged 255 on the 750s, 8 in North Dakota. And uh, the futures today were, uh, they were up about a dollar, but they were still down about 247. So you see about a $7 positive basis. So when we go to next year, then we see those uh, gold uh, squares below the cash market. So that doesn't mean that we are going to be below where we were last year. That's just where the futures are in there. And, you know, there's some risk off in futures too and that has been occurring the last uh, a couple of months. They, they were very strong. And then uh, the some of the funds started bailing out of the futures market and so on, and they went down. But again, we have that positive basis for our, our good cattle up here. And, you know, the shorter the supply, the stronger our basis is up here because the feedlots just have to come further to get them. And, and that helps us out. And I think the futures, as we go along, you know, today, uh, the, the November futures is up a dollar when the rest of them are down 50 cents to a dollar simply because they, those two uh, have to come together. So, you know, I, we're, we'll have another good year uh, on prices for sure on, on, on yearlings and on calves for that matter. So again, the reason why we've had a little weakness in these heavyweight yearlings is on the top, our fed steer prices. And again, they've been higher at cyclical high, record high levels uh, pretty much all year. Although, uh, you know, when I talked to you a month ago, they were the same because beef production this year is good. Actually, in the last WASDE report, USDA now has raised beef production in the U.S. a little above last year, even though we have we have fewer cattle. It's 720,000 fewer beef cows to start the year. And so we've got, uh, you know, we've got less cattle. Uh, our weights are running way above last year. And I talked about this before, making up uh, enough. Uh, we uh, The, the sl weights on slaughter steers and heifers now are high enough that it's the equivalent of killing another 20 to 25,000 head of cattle a week. And if that continues through the rest of the year, it's going to amount to around uh, 720,000, uh, the, the equivalent of 720,000 head. And that's the exact number that our beef cow numbers went down last year. So kind of an interesting uh, sidelight there. But anyway, yeah, <clears throat> fed cattle have uh, dropped off uh, the, the last couple of weeks as the cutout value has went down and the, the uh, Thanksgiving holiday is coming up that I'll talk about in a minute. So that's uh, kind of put a lid on the heavyweight prices. And then on the bottom, our Omaha corn prices, and I like to use Omaha because that's where the feedlots are. And you see, after being very positive for cattle going uh, down uh, since uh, mid-year, they did spark here the last week for the reasons that Frayne talked about. So uh, uh, I, I didn't communicate with Brian before this, but he showed you this. So again, just call your attention. And if you want to know more about price risk protection that uh, he mentioned, uh, there's my talk that you can go to that we have on our website there. So just finish up. Thanksgiving is getting close. And uh, 
and uh, some of you at least may be buying turkeys and there's all this hype lately in the news media about uh, grocery prices going up and they're higher and higher and higher but in the case of thanksgiving turkeys that is not the case i'm i'm not going to talk much about it because our newsletter that just came out with this week i wrote uh, kind of a, a long article on the, on the factors affecting turkey prices basically the cliff notes is the purple line there was 2022 turkey prices were historically very high at thanksgiving time simply because that was a tough year for avian influenza and uh, minnesota is our top turkey state and uh, in the flyway and lost uh, lots and lo millions of turkeys there and so we were a little we were a short supply uh, but then throughout last year then they went down as even influenza got under control and production picked up and so uh actually uh prices have been very level this year uh at average prices of the of 2017 to 21 so they're uh lower the other thing to talk about when we talk about turkey prices there's going to be bargains on turkey prices and there always are because retail stores tend to loss leader them or even they have uh giveaways where if you buy 50 dollars or whatever the number might be of groceries they give you a free turkey so they lose money on the turkeys to get you in to buy the potatoes and green beans and dressing and cranberries and everything else so you know there'll be plenty of turkeys around this uh, fall at bargain prices so with that happy thanksgiving and uh i'll turn it over to ron i was trying to come up with a topic to for for today and i didn't really know what to do so i i, I guess i thought i would talk about the the possible secretary of agriculture picks i don't think they they picked one at this point to, uh, as of today um before i get into that i wanted to talk about the uh income tax uh, in, uh, the egg producer income tax workshop that we got coming up, a little promo here. It's set for December 2nd from 1 to 4 via Zoom. Um, I will be the moderator, and we have a person from the IRS, Al Gr Gregerson, Russ Tweeten from Egg Country, um, Rob Holcomb from U of M, and then we got a new person this year, J.C. Hobbs, well-renowned tax specialist from Oklahoma State, uh, covering a, a variety of topics uh, uh, for for, for agriculture, um, it's, it's going to cost $20 to read, and then you need to register, and you can call that contact number on the bottom there if you have any questions. So with that, uh, some of you probably have seen this. Uh, I, I stole this stuff from the from the Ag Web. Um, they had 15 possible nominations for Ag Secretary. Uh, I, these are just in alphabetical order, uh, not necessarily of of, uh, of who might get it, but the, on the, alphabetically, our, our North Dakota Governor Burgum is first. Of course, remember, he ran against Trump, and then he started campaigning for him. Uh, he's also being considered for Secretary of Energy. Mike Conaway, some of you probably remember him. He's a former representative from Texas, now a private consultant. Uh, he's actually one of the only person who's not in office now who is who has dealt with the farm bill. Greg Dowd from Kansas served as a seat, as a chief agricultural negotiator, and he had the rank of ambassador in, in the office of U.S. Trade Representative. Zippy Duvall, he's the head of the American Farm Bureau. He's been that been the head since 2016. He operates a farm in Georgia. Sarah Fry, uh, she's very young. She's the founder of the of Fry Farms in Illinois. She established at, at the age of 16, can you imagine? And she, it's grown into a major enterprise, the largest producer of pumpkins in the United States. Charles Herbster, uh, he's a fifth generation farmer from Nebraska, CEO of uh, Carrico Farms, Herbster, Her Herbster Ag Angus Farms, and, and Conklin Company. Senator C Cindy Hyde-Smith, she's a senator from Mississippi. She's currently on the Agriculture Committee. Um, and on that committee, she was very influential in, in, uh, in passing the, the previous 2018 Farm Bill. Abel Mon Mondelero, he was a California le Lieutenant Governor back in the 10 to, to 11. Uh, he, was, he was considered uh, for Ag Secretary by Trump the first time, but was not nominated. And he runs a runs a business there in California. Thomas Massey, 
He's from Kentucky, where he grows chickens on his on his property. He's he's been promoting raw milk versus pasteurized milk. Ted McKinney from Indiana. Uh, he serves as CEO of the National State Departments of Agriculture, and he was actually the Undersecretary of Ag for Trade and Foreign and Agricultural Affairs, um, and he was and, and the Director of the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. Uh, he also used to work for Dow and Elenco. Some of you may have heard of Sid Miller. He's the Texas Ag Commissioner. Um, he served in this role since 2015. He's a rancher and, and has a commercial uh, nursery business. Now, if I can pronounce this woman's name, it's Aurelia uh, Skipworth Giacomonti. She's an attorney and a businesswoman and a biolog biologist who actually served at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from 2019 to 21. She's currently serves as a secretary of the Louisiana Department of Environmental, Con Environmental Quality. Ray Starling uh, from, from uh, uh, North Carolina, he's an attorney. Um, he's a he was a chief of staff to to the previous Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. He was a principal advisor to the president and a special assistant to the president for agriculture and trade and food assistance. Uh, he was also the chief of staff, uh, chief of staff and chief counsel to to uh, uh, Senator Tillis. And we probably know G.T. Thompson. He's he's the, currently the House Ag Chairman of the uh, of the Ag Committee. He is a representative from Pennsylvania, 15th District. Uh, pr prior to entering politics, he was in healthcare. I guess that's something I didn't know about him. Um, he supported work and job trainings for the SNAP beneficiaries, and he's been very active in crafting the 2024 Farm Bill. Tim Kopp, Indiana farmer, transferred, formed his farm into one of the biggest farms in Indiana. Um, he served as, as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Agencies for Food and Agriculture. So with that, there are 15 nominations. We don't know if any, any of those will get picked or somebody new, but I just thought this would be an interesting topic for you to, to look at. So we'll entertain questions at the end, and I will stop sharing and send it over to Dr. Ripplinger. Yep. Uh, so I'll cover a couple of different things today. Uh, first, some expectation of what's going to happen in the biofuel markets uh, through the end of 2025. Uh, this is using information that the Department of Energy updates monthly. It's called the Short-Term Energy Outlook. I've, I've talked about it before, um, but thought it was definitely worth revisiting again uh, with, with a few of the things that are going on in biofuels and the economy generally. Uh, this first chart uh, is looking at uh, fuel ethanol, so ethanol used for fuel. We also use ethanol for industrial purposes and obviously beverages. Uh, but here we're looking on the energy fuel side. Uh, a couple things to look at. And again, I, I presented this quarterly and it actually looks better annually for some of the, you know, comparing year to year. Uh, but we are expecting record production of ethanol uh, in the United States uh, next year for the calendar year 25, uh, which does and doesn't make sense. I'll have to talk about one other thing. I mean, one of the things we've talked about over the last few months is that use is flat uh, domestically. Uh, you know, ethanol has essentially secured its place in the feedstock. You know, it's a 10% blend in most gasoline. And as gasoline use is is stable, the somewhat declining ethanol is, is kind of holding its own, which is good. Uh, so the question becomes, where does this excess production go? And the answer uh, is pretty obviously exports. And, and visit about that the last couple of months as well. Those those growing export markets are, are really a very nice strong lift for ethanol here in the short run. And of course, that's continuing on into 2025, um, which is good news. Uh, moving over to biodiesel, and here I actually did switch over to looking at data annually. And here we can see a dip, both in terms of the blue line. So that's product supply. The way DOE looks at it is they don't have, uh, you know, like retail sales or whole, wholesale sales, as we might think. Well, this is really just pushing it out beyond the, the biorefinery, the stuff that leaves there. Uh, that isn't that doesn't end up in an export market ends up in that bucket. It's a little bit of a different bucket than we have uh, in agriculture for the most part. And of course, production uh, is understandable. You know, the 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 big thing th there that really jumps out is this year we're going to see a slight decline, and then next year we're going to see it fall again. Um, and you know, quite precipitously next year, um, biodiesel for the most part, you know, has been relatively flat for the last five or six years, I mean, really broadly speaking, 
kind of held its own against renewable diesel, but it looks like this year and even more so next year, it's going to st start to lose a little bit of ground. Um, switching over to renewable diesel, uh, you know, the big thing that we can look at here is, you know, we're going to have production rise and some of this will use the feedstock that has been going to biodiesel, which is nice. Uh, but a lot of what's happening is will actually be meeting that domestic demand. So the red line is product supply. So this is what's going out into the market domestically. And if you see in past years, production wasn't uh, keeping pace. Next year, we're going to have uh, that that gap filled with, with domestic production going up somewhat and renewable diesel product supply being flat for the year. Um, last chart is other biofuels. This is now, it used to be like rounding air for a lot of different things. And this catches SAF, which is the big one now uh, in terms of volume, but there's also bio-based naphtha and a lot of the different minor distillates and things that you see in petroleum, you can also get from biofuel production, uh, depending on what, what methods you're using. Uh, as I talked about, especially this big announcement in July, you know, we're expecting SAF production to to increase pretty quickly uh, into 2025 with the refinery that Philip 66 brought online and with the expectation that that SAF is going to have a home. Um, another big thing that kind of happened uh, announcement in the last couple of weeks uh, was a new sustainable aviation fuel refinery uh, for Moorhead uh, made a lot of news. I guess that was little, it's almost two weeks ago. Um, very interesting. Um, talk a little bit about the details. I mean, obviously, $5 billion is a big number. 650 jobs is a big number, um, but a little bit unique. Uh, first thing, just for background, because I never talk about this. So we have all of these different conversion uh, technologies. So, you know, we have fermentation to produce ethanol. You know, we have transesterification for biodiesel. We have hydro treating for... Uh, for SAF and renewable diesel generally, well, with Fisher Tropsch, and again, the, the 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 Moorhead plant is looking at using biomass, cellulosic material, you know, straw and stover and all of those things, um, and then using Fisher Tropsch. And Fisher Tropsch is really unique. So the idea is you're going to take this material, and you can just follow the the, the flow diagram there. You know, you you have this material, you're going to dry it, you gasify it, so heat it up, and then clean it up and really what they're doing is you're, you're going to break the 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 biomass into these component chemicals you know basically down to the molecular level and then recombine them to make something you want and so in this case what we want is SAF or it could be renewable diesel or other products um, but that's really what we're looking at it's a in the scheme of things a uh, kind of old, kind of new technology. The Germans used it during World War II as they didn't have access to, to petroleum or were running low on supplies of petroleum. They used fischer tropsch um, One of the big things with this, it's very much a, a scale um, technology where you need economies of scale in terms of the size of the refinery to make the economics work. But then that pushes back on the, how do you get enough biomass to, to operate? Um, some questions, you know, why Minnesota, why Moorhead? Uh, Minnesota does have a relatively generous state level tax credit for refineries that operate in the state, $1.50 a gallon, uh, which on top of $1.75 credit uh, for 45Z uh, is, is a substantial amount of money, plus uh, the RIN that would be created as well. So it's stacking a lot of different uh, sources of income. And then I thought it was interesting too, one of the reasons they picked Moorhead is that they had a site ready and you know some of what my position is is working with project developers and it's amazing how helpful it is when you have a lot of the groundwork done uh and have you know that answer or that piece of a puzzle that somebody's looking for in this case it happened to be moorhead having a site and one of the big things there was like just having one that was big enough to, to actually uh be a home to that refinery uh, then a little bit of math to understand scale. So a lot of what I've done in my position, not so much recently, but up until about five years ago, was looking at biomass logistics and just kind of working through how big this facility is and what it needs. So the announced capacity from the press release is 193 million gallons. 
Uh, so that's that would be the equivalent of a pretty big corn ethanol refinery. I mean, that's that, that's a good size refinery. It also happens to be about 10 times an order of magnitude bigger than what most folks have thought would be the first size plant of this type. And again, we, we do have Fisher Trope facilities. Um, they, you know, we've had them for a while and they, they operate. Um, but what they were looking at in terms of bioenergy was something that was closer to 20 million gallons as opposed to 200. Uh, and just doing some math quick, back of the envelope, I'm an economist, not a, uh, not a thermochemist. You need about 100 pounds of biomass per gallon. Uh, dry biomass, and then just doing the math quick, that means you need about 10 million tons of biomass annually. And this equates to that facility after having to receive about 46 truckloads of baled biomass every hour of every day of the year. Um, so it's a massive amount of material. You can also look at what the, the catchment area would have to be. Uh, they would need material from millions of of, of acres. And in fact, you know, you think you, you probably wouldn't be removing more than a, a million, excuse me, a ton from each acre. So you might be talking about 10 million acres of, of biomass, you know, that crop residue being, being removed. It's a, it's a, it's a very massive in terms of scale. Uh, the last thing I have is just a answer to a question I got a few weeks ago. I'm, Ron talked about it you know, last month in the webinar, we had those unfortunate wildfires in Western North Dakota, but it raises the question, you know, what, how do these carbon programs deal with wildfires? And so, you know, the question would be for that case, if that, a farmer had entered into a contract, a uh, carbon offset contract for uh, adopting no-till or, or whatever those practices were, and then suddenly it's a wild, wildfire, what does that mean? And for most of the the programs that exist for carbon offset programs, or even for things like the California low carbon fuel standard, they'll typically keep a pool of excess credits uh, for uncertainty like this. So it could be something where it could be measurement error or conditions don't lead to as much uh, soil organic carbon being located in the soil, or it could be something like a wildfire. And of course, with all of that, you have to have estimates of what you expect is going to happen. And for that to be somewhat correct in order to have the, that, that sufficient pool. Um, but that's that's the typical answer for other for other uh, carbon frameworks. So if you're talking about insets, so if you're talking about producing uh, grain that might be, you know, milled and used to, to make bread, or if you're talking about like a federal program, like a tax credit, they don't do the math the same way. So it doesn't matter. And I don't think they'll necessarily have to worry about this or won't take these actions. But for these other parts of this, this carbon market, that, that, that those pools of excess credits are a critical part of how they function, especially with uh, that, that uncertainty that might occur. Uh, that's all that I had. And so we have time for- Yeah, you have a question there, Dave, about 87, 89% octane gas. See that yeah. one? Oh, yeah, a price spread for 87, 89 octane. So at the retail level, that's really, really tough to get. Um, I don't have I don't have good retail data. There are people who would gladly sell it to me, um, but they know what it's worth and it's worth a lot. Um, you know, that spread, if you're talking about, you know, and, and, and you should see this. I mean, you can do your own sample at... Um, as, as you as you go to the gas station, you know, there's typically a significant premium for ethanol free gas. Uh, and one of the reasons the primary initial driver is that ethanol as an octane provider is significantly lower cost than petroleum based alternatives, aromatics. So, you know, benzene, uh, all of those things in the like xylene. Um, that's part of it. The other thing is that it ends up being the 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 ethanol free product ends up being a bit of a specialty product where you have to go and search for it. Right. You know, in my, you know, the gas station that's close to my house, you know, fortunately they have pumps. That's great. But you know, if, if they don't, you might have to drive a little bit. And so that creates this, you know, this premium because of its unique nature. Uh, so you have this initial, like what's the cost of producing it. Um, but then you also have this, this demand side issue, which causes that spread. Um, I don't have those numbers at hand. Um, you could, you could, 
and I guess I could, I mean, you could cr create a little, little scraper and go grab like gas buddy data to see that, that difference. Um, but yeah, it's, it's big and it's, it's bigger. And again, much of that driver is, you know, is that, that cost of the alternative octane source and then this other premium, you know, and one thing I could do, I really appreciate the question. You know, I know the, 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 the wholesale price of those, those aromatics. And so you could do a little math to see, okay, what is driving this? It's, it's going to be a little bit cost. Um, but it is, to me, it would be much more on the demand side. And again, too, there's, there's this whole backside of it on the petroleum side again, because they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're putting a whole barrel into the process, right? And they get this, for the most part, this fixed ratio of things coming out and, depending on what they're pushing out, it may or may not match up well with the market. And then all of a sudden, if you have these mismatches, you can, and especially for something like aromatics, aromatics, it's not a whole lot of material in that barrel. You know, that can lead to those points, you know, in the, in the curve where, you know, it can cause those bigger price changes. Great question. I see, I had some questions regarding that farm act. Uh, it looks like there's about three of them or so that are, basically the same question uh i was going to try answer that that's another ad hoc program that's it's going around through congress it it, it was about a 20 billion dollar deal that they're talking about uh it's it's providing 100 basically they just took the cost national cost of production for the various crops and took 60 percent and then they're going to uh, divide by the number of acres or, or yeah and then they're going to uh, pay by the by your planted acres so for corn, it would be about $103 an acre, soybeans 48 and wheat 82, which is seems to be a lot of money, but you are eliminated to 175,000 max. So about 6 billion of that would go for corn and another almost two and a half billion would go for, for soybeans. Who knows if this will ever amount to anything, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's just an ad hoc thing that they tried in the absence of uh, passing the farm bill. And that's about all I know about it. Another question for you, Dave, about biofuels under the new administration. Yeah, so there's a bit of uncertainty. Um, th there's different dynamics. And if you think about the different ways that uh, federal policy impacts biofuels and agriculture, um, it, and also looking at what the administration has said and, and done in their last, in their last uh, time in office, you know, in general, uh, the Trump administration was vocally very supportive of biofuels and, and production agriculture of farming. Um, that didn't necessarily uh, translate to uh, pursuing ways in which the RFS would fully benefit uh, or uh, lead to higher uses of biofuels. Um, I think the bigger question now, and also too, at the, you know, within the administration, because you have these questions about, you know, what does the administration think about carbon and climate? Well, if we go back to 2020 uh, and even 2019 into 2020, the administration, the USDA under under Trump, you know, they were very open to and saw carbon, climate, all of these things as a, a positive for production agriculture and something that they generally we're open to supportive, uh, you know, I think back to, there was a wall street journal article on, on the issue that went, went pretty far in depth. Um, I don't know if that will necessarily change. The other last issue is thinking about finances generally and how they might translate into, uh, moving into the, the first year as well as future policy. And in, you know specifically talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, so that was the 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 bill passed you know a few years ago with a massive amount of support for energy across the board for projects across the board. And one of the concerns is that you know using rescission, you know you could go back and you know with reconciliation, you go back and, 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 and cross out a lot of those numbers, change a lot of those numbers. And, you know, that's a possibility depending on how fiscally conservative or, or fiscally aggressive the administration and Congress wants to be. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of supporters for those programs. So the general thought is, 
you know, they if they get touched, it probably wouldn't be by much because behind each one of those 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 budget lines is a constituency who's going to fight pretty hard to keep it. Another question for you is the Moorhead biomass plant going to use sugar beet byproducts? Yeah, so they really haven't said much specifically about the material that they'll use. They certainly could. Um, Fisher Tropsch is actually, I mean, it's very forgiving because you basically just throw stuff into the system and it breaks it down to chemicals. Uh, because there's a lot of material available, you know, very, very close to where the refinery would be built. It seems like a natural potential source uh, or a natural feedstock to source. Um, but I, there, there's a lot more to come. Again, that project isn't expected to be, or that facility isn't expected to be operating until 2030. And between now and then, they will have to do a lot in terms of finding the feedstock necessary to support. And again, is it crop residue? Is it something else? Is it uh, beet tailings and the like? Possibly. And I think that's everything. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're quite a ways over. Thank everybody for staying with us until the end. For those who did, uh, we will be posting this online in our next uh, webinar is December 12th, uh, the Thursday after the WASD comes out. And so we'll see you then. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.